There is a picture, a dizzying portrait of a singular moment, a snapshot of sheer bedlam and joy. It is happiness and madness and football and wild youth. There are hands reaching up, there is laughter and disbelief, and people are taking pictures because they want the moment to last forever. When the dirty blanket of despair threatens to cover him up, swallow him whole, a fog so thick that he can't see, can't breathe. When talking about the kid doesn't help, when talking about anything else doesn't make sense, he sits here and watches. When the constant craving to hold her boy to touch his hair and his face and feel his arms around her, to soothe his fears in the way that only a mother can, when the dull weight of sorrow feels like it might grind her into tiny pieces, she comes here. It is a place called the Palouse, and the rolling wheat fields you will find there are like a living sea. Wave upon wave of golden grain sways in the hot breeze of eastern Washington. It is the richest wheat land in the world, and it forms a curious and stunning kind of beauty. And plopped down in the middle of the wheat dunes is a school. There is a country soulfulness to the place. It is home to a fierce underdog mentality, a stubborn, prideful sense of us against the world. It is Washington State University. In the photo, a young man has been hoisted onto the shoulders of his teammates and they're carrying him off the field. He is floating on a sea of happiness, awash in glory and love, and we see only the back of his head and the name Halinsky and the number three on his back. To look at the picture is to be swept away into a dream come to life. The boy is Tyler Halinsky and he is on top of the world. The picture is beautiful and the boy is gone. To belong here at this place is to have gone to the end of the world only to discover that it's the center of the universe, or so it seems. It is a place where countless thousands have found themselves and where at least one boy, a 21-year-old sweet soul of a quarterback from Claremont, California, became lost. In the sun-drenched paradise of Southern California, surrounded by beaches and surf and great football, he was the kid who always won. Tyler Halinski was confident and polite and personable. My hair right now, I think I look like the great Gatsby. He, he was just a beautiful, sweet son who always made me feel so good and so loved. He was just good. There wasn't, um, you know, kids are moody and and difficult to be around sometimes, and he never was. And he always seemed to win at everything. And I, I don't know how else to describe it besides he was a gamer. It just, it didn't matter. He found a way to win, and it drove me, you know, crazy. It drove me nuts. I couldn't stand it. He beat me at everything, and I'd lose money to him. I'd lose bets. There were three Holinsky boys, Kelly, the oldest, Tyler, and little Ryan. Kelly, he's just such a great big brother. Uh, he just, he's taught me everything. Uh, I used to be his receiver now. I'm learning from him, doing the five-step, three-step, everything, and trying to follow in his footsteps. Kelly played quarterback at Weber State University. When people ask what was he like or how did he carry himself, it sounds like a cliche, but he really was the, the light in the room that everyone kind of gravitated towards. Leroy Cloud met Tyler in kindergarten. Uh, we're best friends. Yeah, and then it got to the point where it's like, we're not even best friends anymore, we're more like brothers. There are old photos of the two of them growing closer and learning about life. Snapshots of an all-American childhood in sunny Southern California. He just made you feel better about yourself. Like, what he said, like his compliments all the time. Like, he just make you, he made you feel like a stud all the time, 24-7. <laughs> he had a sweetheart in high school named Sophie Engel, 
They dated for three years. Tyler was the goofiest guy. I think that's why we clicked so fast, was because he's a weirdo. <laughs> he was a mama's boy, a homebody. I'm Ty! <laughs> he, he loved watching movies, loved eating pizza, just completely down to earth things. <laughs> Through the lens of Sophie's cell phone, an image takes shape. Okay. <laughs> quick to smile, quick to laugh. Car! Silly and charming. Uh. My nose is itchy. Don't make me sneeze, please. Stop. 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 <laughs> I have another hair, but. Say bananas. Bananas. <laughs> he was my best friend. As a quarterback at Upland High School, he lit up the Friday night skies with leather rockets launched from a howitzer of an arm. Even before his senior season, he decided to accept a scholarship to Washington State. And I know that I'm going to be going to a great uh, program in Wazoo and playing for head coach Mike Leach. I can't wait. I'm excited. And he left and he, he went to Pullman because he loved the people. A yeah, great kid, very engaging, uh, a lot of energy. Um, one of those guys that uh, kind of lit up the room, you know, just uh, always had a certain amount of energy when he came in. So who were you rooting for, Crimson or Gray? Oh, both, obviously, whatever team I was on at the time. Uh, I mean, either one. Cougs in general, right? As a freshman, after a redshirt year, he got into a game against Arizona in 2016. As the number two quarterback, you have to be ready at all times in case Luke goes down um, and just be ready to lead the team. And um, you just start getting ready, start getting the adrenaline going and stuff like that. Washington State was up 55-7 to seven in the fourth quarter. When Tyler came in, he knew he was going to sling the rock. He was going to, he didn't care, you know. Tyler and I had this little connection when we got out on the field. We kind of had like a little head nod, you know. It was just kind of like an inner thing that, you know, both him and I had you know, when we got on the field. Uh, you know, we knew we wanted to take a shot. Even in a blowout, running out the clock was not an option. He uncorked a bomb to a streaking River Craycraft. I was insane, uh, especially the river. So I took my official visit up here uh, when River had his great game against Cal. I think he had three touchdowns that game, and then throwing him my first, you know, college touchdown pass. It's it's indescribable. It's it's a great feeling. He had the arm strength to make throws that you're thinking, no, 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 nice throw, Tyler. <laughs> it's one of those things. And Tyler, just he was a remarkably talented quarterback. Uh, you know, could really throw it well, could run, you know, could beat you with his feet, too. Early on at WSU, Tyler met a lanky, soft-spoken receiver named C.J. Dimery. He was goofy. He was, you know, like, funny. He <laughs> would crack jokes with anybody. The traps. <laughs> like, from the part of me, the person he's closest to, to maybe, like, a new freshman on the team. Like, he would want to get to know everybody and just, you know, spread his energy. Their bond was almost immediate. CJ was hiding a secret in those days. I had been struggling with depression probably since I was 19. Um, that's something not a lot of people know. And um, one time I just opened up to him and I was like, look, I felt safe with him, you know? I know he's not gonna go tell other people and I know he's, he genuinely cares, cared about me and he would do whatever to help. So I felt like it was a safe place for me to, you know, get out my feelings and tell them, you know, what's going on with me and... There are two things that constantly come up about Tyler as a person. One is empathy. You're the only guy in the room. If it was just the two of you, he would want to know about you and how you're doing and your family and... I mean, that's why he was so tight with everybody on the team because he was always asking about how's your day, what's going on and stuff like that and he just never talked about himself. And the other thing is that he was happy. Everybody, everybody says he was the happiest guy in the room. <sighs> Happy? I mean, he was one of the happiest kids I've ever met. You know, whenever I, whenever I saw him off the field, he would always have a smile on his face. He was a positive guy and he was always smiling. His smile was contagious. Like, he, he'd walk in, give you a look, a smile, you were smiling. He was just, just happy-go-lucky guy, always, always as positive as can be. And uh, it, it just, you know, radiated and, and everybody picked that up. I'm sure from the friends that you have and I have. I mean, you can only pick out a certain few that are always smiling, 
always have a good attitude, and, and he really was one of those guys. His smile is beautiful. And when he smiles, his eyes get these little, like, lines. The smile. It lit up rooms and hearts. It dazzled, disarmed, and at some point, somewhere along the way, it became a sparkling, radiant, brilliant disguise. Winds from the south blew in silt and dust for tens of thousands of years. Dunes were formed and there evolved a rolling sense of serenity and isolation. There is no place like the Palouse anywhere in the world. It is unique. The same can be said of the school. It's not for everybody, this place. But for the ones who allow it to get under their skin, to sink into their soul, it becomes a part of who they are. I think being a Cougar is, what it means to be a Cougar is to always have a home here. You look almost any direction and outside of a couple miles you see wheat fields. We're all in this together. The pride here is like unbelievable. There's just like always like a friendly face and I don't know, I just feel like everybody is looking out for each other and I always feel safe on this campus. That's the difference. Who care? It's just such a unique sense of community here and such a sense of support and everywhere you go, you see someone you know and I just, I love that. Zach Anders is a senior. It felt like we were, we knew exactly what we were and what this community is to us and how much we love to be Cougs. We, we knew that so it was just so deep in our bones and now it feels like there's a tinge of uncertainty. There's just a something hanging over our heads and we don't know what it is or how to deal with it and, and what to call it. Classes are back in session. A new batch of seniors are finishing up the four happiest years of their life. But something is different, changed. It does not feel the same as before. It is something that every athlete thinks about every day. It is something that, you know, we have to live with. It's something that the football team has had to live with every day. An athlete either believes or they don't. There's no convincing or coercing. Doubt is a quarterback's cancer, and even though he was a backup to the starter, senior Luke Falk, Tyler knew how good he was, believed in himself. There was no doubt, ever. That's how he sort of lived. That's why we call him Superman, all right? He was just, I'm just, I got this. I'm going to do it. And he always believed that. He always thought. One more play. Just yeah. one more play. We got this. Whatever. Third and 30 or first and you know two, it didn't matter. He knew he had it and he was just waiting for his chance. There are those who will tell you that Tyler earned the starting job in camp going into the 2017 season. But Luke Falk was a Heisman hopeful, a guy who had shattered records. He was entrenched and so Tyler waited. He, he was tired of waiting for his chance and you know, he, he couldn't wait till he was going to show everybody what he had. Before the second game of the season against Boise State, as the team marched through Bowler Gym, Tyler spotted his mom. <laughs> Luke Falk struggled in that game. The Cougs struggled. Nothing was working. Well, what now is a new quarterback? Uh, there's Tyler Helinski, the redshirt sophomore. So here's Helinski's first pass. Tyler entered the game like a bucking colt set free at last, stomping and snorting. He was fearless. There is that scrambling ability for Helinski. Good size. He's gonna throw it again. He completed seven straight passes before this. It looked like his day was done. Luke Falk came back in. But in the fourth quarter, he took a vicious hit and was knocked out of the game. With 10 minutes and change left in the game and the Cougs down by three touchdowns, Tyler was back in. 
it was an impossible situation. When he'd go in, I'd kind of like we'd just kind of look at each other and go, like, okay, it's time to time to throw the ball around now. He marched the team down the field and then hit Jameer Calvin for a touchdown. He it out and he's got a touchdown. First offensive touchdown of the game. <laughs> he just thinks it's there's no end to this. He's playing. He's got his guys. He's at, at his field. This is this what he lived for. The stadium came alive. The Cougars came alive. Everything changed. Cozart, shovel pass. Oh, a dangerous move. It is picked up by Palouer. Holinsky kept slinging the rock. Touchdown, Washington State. Jamal Murray. Even now, watching it, Mark Holinsky has moments when he gets lost in the sheer improbability of it all. That got him all back, didn't it? He just, he played like Superman, like almost. With the game tied, they went to overtime, and then another overtime. <laughs> I felt like a proud dad. <laughs> I was like, I, I couldn't believe it, honestly. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I think I was just shocked because, I mean, I didn't think anybody could have done what he did in that amount of time that we had. Mark and Kim alternated going to games. It was Kim's turn to be in Pullman. Mark and Ryan were watching at home on TV. Kelly was in Ogden, Utah, working at the hospital. Leroy was home in Southern California. In the third overtime, Boise State kicked a field goal. A Cougar touchdown would win it. A rush of four, Helinski has his left. Caught made of the catch of the 20 yard line. More over the 10, runs for the win, dives for the pylon. Touchdown, Washington State. Touchdown, Washington State if it stands. Ruling on the field stands. Touchdown, Washington. You know, thumbs up, touchdown, and the place sort of went crazy. It's a comeback for the ages, an all-time Cougar win. Ryan and I hugged each other like like the movie Step Brothers. I mean, it was just jumping for joy. I was screaming, jumping up and down, going absolutely berserk. Being there for my best friend and seeing him, like, I, I had a front row seat. It was, it was one of the best nights of my life, personally. Cougar fans stormed the field, jumping up and down, screaming for joy. It was the kind of thing that college students and football fans remember for the rest of their lives. But that Boise State game, that, that was, just an incredible experience. Amidst the madness, some players picked up Tyler and carried him on their shoulders. And for a moment in time, everything was perfect. Who wouldn't want to be carried by, you know, thousands of people? <laughs> like, it's like a story, but it's like it's something you see in a movie. Uh, I mean, shoot, I was just playing football out there, uh, surrounded by a group, great, or great group of guys. Um, just told me they had faith in me. I was just ready to do my job. And I remember waiting. We all waited in the football building, and and he came out, and we hugged everybody. Everybody hugged, and so we walked, and you know he put his arm around me, and I do remember him saying and looking at me, and he said, "Did that just happen?" And I said, "I know, Ty. I, it did, and you have to enjoy it because I do." I said, "I remember saying." because this doesn't always happen to, to quarterbacks. I remember telling him, I said, Todd, you, you lived the dream that I had. You, you got to be carried off a field after winning a quadruple overtime game on ESPN. You're living the dream that I've had since I was a kid. I am so happy for you. I'm so ecstatic. I'm so overjoyed at, that you got to do that. I couldn't do it. I, was, I wasn't good enough. I didn't have that opportunity. Tyler did and it's almost like we got to share it together. This is what he does. I told you, I've seen it countless times in practice over the three years I've been there. Like, it's not out of the ordinary at all. Like, it just got to be shown. Like, that was just a sneak preview of what was supposed to come next for him. There is a picture that was taken that night. It is happiness and madness and football and wild youth. It was snapped by Brandon Ferris. Well, I just happened to be in the uh, right place at the right time, honestly. I mean, as you can see, there are players everywhere, all over the place in the crowd there. And then all of a sudden, I look up and I see they propped him up on the shoulder. So, of course, I started to try to be my way 
through the line there to get there. Unbelievable, to be honest. I've never had a photo like it. The Holinsky family holds on to that photo, and they say they will for the rest of their time on Earth. And what I see in that picture is exactly Tyler times 100, which was he wanted everyone to be happy. There was another picture, too, taken just seconds after the first one. In this one, you can see Tyler's face and his arms are raised, but he looks slightly embarrassed, as if he's thinking, come on, guys, put me down. In retrospect, it's easy to wonder if maybe it was lonely up there. He was... Um... Is it comforting to know on any level that, God, at least he had that? No, no, I, I, I don't, I don't find any comfort in anything. No, I, I mean, I'm happy that he enjoyed that game. I'm happy that they won. I'm happy that he played well. I'm his mom. I don't care about football. Comfort, no there's no comfort in anything because all I want is him back. There was something happening on our college campuses. There was a darkness creeping into the hearts and minds of our young people. We're having uh, more mental health needs in our young folks, and we are seeing more deaths by suicide. Sunday Henry is the director of athletic medicine at Washington State. She's aware of the numbers, and they are startling. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among all people aged 15 to 24 and 25 to 34. And it's the second leading cause of death for college students, surpassed only by automobile accidents. These are young people ready to launch themselves into the world the ones who are supposed to be having the time of their lives. Dr. Mary Louise Jones is the chief clinical officer at Navos. She has 25 years of experience dealing with mental illness and suicidal tendencies. Folks experience changes in leaving their families, uh, going off to college, being isolated from others, losing uh, friends and family uh, and, be, and feeling alone. It happens everywhere, even in the tight cocoon that is Pullman, Washington. I think suicide on campus before Tyler's death was hushed. It wasn't talked about. And I've heard more since his death about suicides on college campuses, not just here, but across the Pac-12, across the country. I've heard more about it since his death than I ever did before. And I have to imagine that, that we feel a responsibility now to him to continue to talk about it. You know, Andrew Cooper is a cross-country runner and the president of the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. He remembers the light that Tyler Holinsky hauled around with him on campus. He carried himself with an enthusiasm for life and happiness that was rare. And it was so rare that even without talking to him, he could make you feel better about yourself. Andrew now talks about things that used to go unspoken. Things like the fact that suicide rates for college students have increased 200% since the 1950s. I think Tyler opened the floodgates to the conversations around mental health because he was the last person anyone expected to be affected by this. How do you tell somebody that you're thinking of killing yourself without them freaking out? Like how it doesn't happen. As the owner of the Coug for 15 years, Bob Cady's is a unique perspective on college students. I see anywhere from 800 to 1,200 new people a year coming through the bar a couple times a week, and, and you get to where you can really see who's, who's struggling and, and you know, kind of see what they're struggling with. And my experience here is most of what people are struggling with are not things that they need to struggle with, they just believe that they have to do better than they're doing. 
and they really don't. A week after the Boise State shocker, Luke Falk was back as the Cougars' starting quarterback, and Tyler was back on the sidelines waiting. Shovels it to Moore, and Washington State takes the lead. They won five out of six games. Falk over the middle, and it's incomplete. But on October 28th against Arizona, once again the offense sputtered. Tyler Holinsky, the sophomore, takes over for Falk. Trailing 20 to 7 with a couple of minutes left in the first half, Coach Leach brought in Tyler, hoping to inject some life into his team. He immediately marched them down the field and ran it in himself for the score. Holinsky now will run, and he dives into the end zone. Touchdown, Cougars! Luke Falk never got back into the game. Tyler completed 45 of 61 passes. Touchdown, Washington State. He threw for two touchdowns and ran for two more. In many ways, it was an astonishing performance. The all-time NCAA record for passing yardage in a game is 734 yards. Tyler passed for 509 yards in just over one half. But there were mistakes. Four interceptions, including this one in the end zone late in the third quarter. And this one returned for an Arizona touchdown. It was also in the third quarter that he took a nasty blow to the head. It was a head-on collision at the one-yard line. To watch it now, knowing what we know, is difficult. He later told his brother Kelly that the hit had rocked him. Arizona won 58-37, and Tyler took the loss hard. I had tons of time back there. Wide receivers were getting open, just... Um, some critical plays where I made mistakes uh, is really what, came, what it came down to. That's a different kid being interviewed. His hat's pulled all the way down. His ours, eyes are really dark. No, nah, it was just nothing. Like, it was just me. I, I was just trying to, you know, make the big play in one play, forcing it, um, you know, not taking what the defense gave me on a few uh, critical plays and just got to learn from that. If you take in the hit and if you take in how sad and somber he looked at that press conference, to me that's a different Tyler that day, that evening. And, and I, I think that um, somebody should have seen it and they didn't. I saw him after the press conference, I saw him before he got on the bus and we talked and he was very, um, he was very, not dejected, he was he was agitated and, and unhappy, which is very not like Tyler. The Holinskys are a tight family. They text each other constantly, but they started to notice some changes after the Arizona game. Tyler wasn't responding to messages. When he did, the answers were short, terse, untyler-like. Things like, um, you know, my phone died, my I overslept, I went to bed early. Those weren't out of the ordinary for Tyler, they were just, they were more of them. I called him on it and said, what, just, I get it. You're busy, you've got the, you've got a lot of stuff going on. I don't want to be in your way, but I don't want you to bail on me, you know, just whatever. And, and he, you know, his response was really typical Tyler, very kind and wonderful and, and loving and don't worry about it, I got this, it's, it's okay. And so I remember texting Ryan. I said, Ryan, something, my brother, I said, Ryan, something's wrong with Ty. He's, he's super sad. Hey, we got to, let's go. Everyone's got to hop in. It's a family thing. Text him, talk to him. We thought he was just sad about the game. Two weeks later, when the Cougs went on the road to play Utah, Kelly sat down with his brother on the balcony at the team hotel, and they talked until 3 o'clock in the morning. He finally just kind of op opened up and said, it, I'm sad, but it's, I can't base the sadness off anything. I can't pick one thing that I'm sad about. It's just an overwhelming sadness. And I remember we talked on that balcony and he promised me it was, it was better now that we talked and it was gonna go away and it was just him being sad like he always was after a, a tough loss. And just like that, on some level anyway, the old Tyler was back. The text messages, the happy, fun kid they all knew so well. And then it seemed after that talk that it almost as if he caught on that we had caught on and he did a better job of hiding it. The family went to Mexico on vacation after that and when Tyler went back to school 
He was once again unresponsive. Nobody knew it at the time, but the overwhelming sadness was back, and the quick smile, the sweet, goofy, happy-go-lucky boy from sunny Southern California was fading away into darkness. On Friday, January 12th, a gun went missing. It was an AR-15. A teammate had left it behind in the apartment that Tyler was moving into. When word got out that it was gone, Tyler helped his teammates look for it. Two days later, he wasn't responding to text messages. Kim sent him a note. She asked, is something wrong, Ty? He responded, nothing's wrong at all. Sorry, Mom. I haven't been with my phone much lately. On the afternoon of January 15th, Tyler went out into the Palouse with several teammates to shoot shotguns at clay pigeons. He didn't hit a single one. He'd never fired a gun before in his life. On the night of January 15th, he played Fortnite well into the evening with teammates and his brother Kelly. The next morning, he went to a 7 a.m. practice session. Later, he texted his wide receivers to remind them about a three o'clock workout. At 10.25, he sent a message to his high school girlfriend, Sophie Engel. I'm sorry for everything, it said. Kim texted him again that day. Tyler, please call me. At 11 o'clock, he dropped off a teammate at class. And then he drove to his old apartment complex, Aspen Village. He was supposed to have moved all of his things out. He'd moved nothing. In the back lot, he parked his car. The AR-15 he'd taken from that empty apartment five days earlier was with him. He tore up his passport, and a shot rang out, leaving a hole in the car. Perhaps it was an accident, perhaps a failed attempt to kill himself. Nobody knows. Nobody heard the shot. He climbed the stairs and opened the door to his old room. He wrote a three-word note on a spiral notepad that included no clues, no answers, no explanation. He walked into a closet with a gun in his hand, and then sitting there alone, unable to shake the unbearable sadness that had somehow consumed his smile and his joy, he put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. The news spread through Pullman like a cold, stinging wind, and it shot out from the happy haven there, across the Palouse, and out into the world to every corner of the country. Sad news tonight from Pullman, Washington. Tyler Holinsky, a quarterback for Washington State, has died of an apparent suicide. Some heartbreaking news out of Pullman, Washington tonight. Former Tragic criminal. news shaking the campus of Washington State, State University. University as fellow students Tyler. grieve the loss of Tyler Holinsky, an athlete. The day after, students gathered and sang, comforting one another, trying to understand. Most of them had never met Tyler Halinski. Coogs help Coogs and just hearing about it, it just brings everyone together. And a week after it happened, there was a larger vigil. It was at the Cougar statue outside Martin Stadium, the place where the comeback kid had performed his greatest escape act. The Holinsky family was there in a fog of shock and grief. The team was there, all of them, and the coaches. There were students too, thousands of students. Kids who knew they'd lost something, but had a hard time articulating exactly what it was. Something extraordinary happened that night. All of them stood there, bonded in grief like one collective soul. And nobody spoke a word. Not a single word.
we really are a family here at WSU. Like, we may not all know each other very well, but we all care about what happens to each other. What I think is that he was fiercely loyal, and, and I know this sounds backwards, but didn't want to hurt anybody and couldn't deal with the disappointment or the shame or the stigma of saying, I don't feel like myself anymore. And that frightened him and he was given, you know, these things are, they dovetail together. He, he was put in a position where he could do something about that in a, in, a, in a certain way, and he took it. You mean the availability of the gun? Yes. I was in complete shock. Like, in that moment, it's not real at all, because you put Tyler and suicide together, and it does not go together. If it can happen to Tyler, if he can go from zero to suicide without his parents who were helicopter parents and his family who watched every you know, move he ever made and cheered him on and loved him to death, um, then it, it's possible that it could happen to anybody. I can't understand it. It's, I don't think I'll ever be able to understand it, to be honest. So I think the thing that's haunting is that in those in those hours and, and maybe even the days right before, how many times did he get close to picking up the phone? Um, how many times did he, did he text and, and, and erase it? Um, those things are haunting, they'll always be. Um, and then, you know, the what ifs, how, how could we have, what would we have done or how could we have, uh, how could we have answered, you know, a question differently or understood what he was going through or, or pressed him on it or helped him with something um, that might have changed the outcome? Yep. So it's something I'm going to have to live with. Um, and just always the question of why did he feel like he had to apologize to me in his last moments on earth, you know? So I think the haunting part is that poor boy crawled in a closet with an AR-15 and he hid from people and he shot himself and that, that's haunting. That's, well, I think, I have tough days because I tell myself, don't go to the closet, Kim. Don't go to the closet. And I go to the closet, all, I go to the closet all the time and I don't. He shouldn't have been in that closet. And that's haunting. And I have to have that with me forever. In a place where the special bond that cougars feel for one another is a seemingly unbreakable thing, even legends were shaken to the core by the death of a young quarterback. It was a death in the family. It was unreal. Tyler, it was the first thing I said, and it was just, I felt like I got kicked in the gut. Well, I think I felt the same thing that, that, that everybody felt. It was just complete and utter shock. Uh, you know, and I immediately talked to, uh, to John, my son, who uh, was very close with Tyler, and I got in the car and drove up there that night because I just wanted to be there with John because uh, it was just, it couldn't have been more shocking. But for the young men and women who walk the hills and attend the classes at Washington State, it was something much different. It was a loss of innocence. A whole generation of cougars were forced to come to terms with things they'd never spoken about. They were forced to grow up. I really vividly remember seeing every athlete gathered around, holding each other, seeing soccer players and volleyball players and basketball players and football players, joining hands, hugging, crying, um, and sort of wondering 
why. And then they started talking. We immediately jumped into to a protective mode for one another. Tyler Holinsky, because he was a quarterback, because he was high profile, started thousands of difficult conversations. In the immediate aftermath, I think that's everybody felt it was our responsibility for Tyler to, if we had been bottling something up, to, to talk about it. Sometimes mental health is really like taboo to talk about, and I think now it really honestly, like, they realize it's just as important, if not more important, than like your, your physical well-being as well. And the conversations are happening still. I think that was my immediate fear was if, if he was to that point, Maybe I could get to that point someday too. And where is that point? And how do I tell if I'm going down that road? Um, I don't think we'll ever get over it. I think um, it's always going to be with us. Tyler's always going to be with us. Um, hopefully a lot of good comes from it. After Tyler's death, his brain was sent to the Mayo Clinic. Two months later, the results came back. Tyler, as it turns out, had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. It is a disease caused by repeated blows to the head. The brain elongates and stretches inside the skull, putting stress on individual nerve cells and leading to the buildup of something called tau. This is a blood vessel right here, um, which is not brown, right? The brown part is, the, is tau. This is the pathological tau. So, um, a normal, healthy brain should have no browns. Dr. Dirk Keen specializes in neuropathology at UW Medicine. So you see the different pattern, Eric? Oh, see yeah. all that brown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is strong evidence that CTE is linked to depression. The parts of the brain affected are important to emotion. The diagnosis for Tyler was stage one of CTE, the lowest level. But Tyler was just 21 years old. For the Holinskys, the presence of CTE is another clue that something wasn't right in their son's mind. We know he had CTE. I, I've talked to a lot of experts, you know, since we got that diagnosis. I'm still trying to understand how CTE played a part in what happened. You don't go from that kid to being gone without some kind of intervening issues, whether it's depression and anxiety and CTE, you know, multiply that or didn't. I don't know, obviously, I, I don't know. Currently, the only way to diagnose CTE is through an autopsy. And so again, everything that's brown is bad, right? And so this brain is full. This is oh, a 72-year-old and it's, so his brain- Dr. Keene emphasizes that while CTE so remains a mystery, depression is treatable. Even if you have a CTE lesion, and even if that CTE lesion can contribute to depression, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only thing. And it doesn't mean that there's no treatment and no support systems and no ways for people to intervene. You know, you, you, you think you know your son so well, so well, and he hid the biggest secret you could possibly have, which is, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And that's so unlike Tyler that I'm afraid that, you know, we'll just be guessing at it for a long time. This would have been Tyler's year. It was going to be his team. And then down the line, the National Football League seemed like a very real possibility. Yeah, I think he certainly had a chance to play on Sundays. You know, if he'd, if he'd been able to have a couple of... Uh, you know, a couple of good seasons here, I think there's a very good chance he could have been uh, an NFL quarterback for sure. The Holinsky home in Irvine has a giant number three flag hanging in front. And inside there are cards and letters and things sent from cougars and good people everywhere. The outpouring has been overwhelming. That picture is there, the one the Holinsky family loves so much. For the longest time, the only question for the Holinskys was why? Why did he do it? But there came to be another why. Why should they get out of bed every day? And the answer became a nonprofit called the Holinsky's Hope Foundation. This is a generational change that's going to take place. It's going to take that long. They put on events and make appearances. They talk about Tyler and they raise money, lots of it. And in the process, they do an amazing thing. 
They used their son's death. They used their own grief as a kind of launching pad. On this night, Mark talked about the WSU students he's met. It's, uh, <laughs> it's with great pride, I can tell you. It's okay. It's all right. You're in good hands. <laughs> Those kids are. Love you, and we love Tyler. Those, um, those kids are unbelievable. The idea is to educate and destigmatize mental illness. There are two programs in particular that Holinsky's Hope is funding. Step Up is a program that teaches students how to take the crucial step of reaching out to help one another. Behind Happy Faces is a mental health curriculum to give young people the educational tools they need to understand mental health. It is taxing and it's heartbreaking, but maybe it will save lives, and maybe it will save the Holinsky family as well. I'm, I'm up for a, a fight. I'm up for doing good things for our student athletes. And, and I, I did promise Tyler, and I'm gonna, I always keep my promises, that we're gonna do good things in his name. If you were to drive north from Pullman, straight out into the wide open, straight into the rich, rolling farmland. If you were to go 10 miles, you would come to a place called Kamiak Butte. Tyler liked the place very much. There was a hike there that he used to like to take. He brought his mom to the place and his brother Kelly. On a beautiful fall morning, the day of the first home game of the new Cougar football season, the Holinsky family marched up the path and they weren't alone. There followed a long line of new friends, one after another. People who knew the story, knew about Holinsky's hope. People who wanted to honor Tyler and comfort the family and be a part of their new mission. At the top there was a flag with the number three on it. There was a light breeze and 150 or so of them stood there and looked out. There were hugs and of course there was a sadness hanging in the air, but there were good feelings too. And this to me, this is, this is what Cougs are all about. And we all consider you guys family. And I, I know I said it last night and I've been saying it, but it, it really is something special to us. After most of the people had left, Mark and Kim and their boys looked out over the panorama of the Palouse laid out before them in spectacular fashion. Maybe they considered their complicated relationship with the place, part love, part hurt, caught in a kind of purgatory drawn to the Palouse because their Tyler loved it, repelled by it too, because this is where he became lost. Tell us for you guys? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Game day is still game day. There was a buzz in the air. WSU's administration wanted to keep references to Tyler low key that night, and that's the way they handled it. Tyler's name was never mentioned. But they did ask the Holinsky family to raise the cougar flag, and the Holinskys accepted. Please welcome Kim, Mark, Kelly, Ryan, the Holinsky family, back to The flag went up, and coug fans responded by waving three flags and holding up three fingers. They showered the Holinskys with love. And then the game got underway, and the new quarterback led the Cougars to victory. You know, if you have a sprained ankle, you know, you go see the trainer. You know, if you, um, you know, if you get hit in the head, you got to go through a concussion protocol. Um, and we have to start to treat, you know, some of this mental illness stuff the same way. You know? That stigma has to come down. And, 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 you know, just as athletes go in to get treated for a pulled ham, you know, if you have something that's troubling you, seek help.
Washington State has added a full-time clinical psychologist to the athletic department. They're doing additional mental health screening now for all football players. And the entire student body has access to an intervention training program called Mental Health First Aid. But the conversation about suicide is such that we haven't even really decided how much of a conversation we should be having. One theory, a theory that Washington State University subscribes to, is that the more we talk about suicide and memorialize those who have taken their own lives, the more likely we are to see it happen. They call it suicide contagion. There's also some other things that can occur with, say, social norming. Uh, the more we talk about suicide and show statistics and write articles about it and do things, then it seems more normal. And so it seems like, well, that's something I could consider. And so the Cougars, at least publicly, discourage their football players from talking much about Tyler Holinsky anymore in hopes of moving on. This is, this is not contagious. This is not something they're going to catch. Um, this is something that is very personal and very complex, and it's not very well understood. There is another theory. It's about teachable moments and tough conversations. It says we should never, ever stop talking about mental illness and suicide, about those who made the choice and why, and what we can learn from them. We often ha have the myth that it's not okay to talk about suicide, that somehow we're gonna plant the idea in somebody's head. And in fact, um, talking very directly with that person, asking them, them if they have thought about harming themselves, what kind of plan they might have, how far they've gone, uh, to really implement that plan, that actually can decrease that person's risk of suicide. This much we know. Because Tyler was a quarterback, because he was high profile, because his death was so shocking, it forced thousands of young people to learn about hard things, to talk about them, and to lean on one another. Depression, what it does, it, it's, it grips you and it makes you feel like you don't matter to anybody, but being able to meet with other people and have those conversations and kind of reassure them, I think that was pretty prevalent throughout. I knew that I had always had like issues with anxiety and other things and I think that after that whole thing happened it made me realize like and having those conversations with people and talking about resources it made me realize that there's nothing wrong with going to talk to someone and so that's what I did. You could see everyone really took a step back and kind of decided, like, we're in this together for sure. Um, everyone changed. C.J. Dimry thinks back to the time he opened up to his friend about being depressed. He remembers Tyler dropping him off at his counseling sessions, and he wonders if that first talk might have saved his own life. C.J.'s message is for anyone who feels the darkness closing in. What you're going through is not always, it's not permanent, you know, and you're going to get past it. You're going to get through it. You just have to give yourself the chance to. And that may be, you know, biting the bullet and opening up to somebody. And that, that's hard. It is. But it's so worth it at the end of the day. And I don't want to see anybody else go through this. I want to see people, you know, seeking help. And yeah, it'll make you super vulnerable, but it's worth your life. I promise you it is. Kelly goes for drives now and talks to his brother. I'm here. I'm alive. I'm, I'm grateful that I have an opportunity to take another breath and, and carry on Tyler's name. It's, it's changed me in ways that I can't even put into words. It's changed the core of who I am. It's changed my relationships with my family. It's changed everything. Sophie has a box that she looks at full of pictures and notes and the remnants of young love. And I found this letter he wrote me once. And at the very end, he signed it, never give up, like comma, tie. And so I found that and I just live by it now. It's there on her arm now, in his handwriting forever. Leroy can't stop wondering why his best friend didn't feel like he could confide in him. Losing Tyler, it's kind of, I've never had this, like, it's like a gaping hole inside. That's just never going to be filled, I feel like, and it's, it hasn't gotten any easier, like, at all. 
CJ talks to Tyler at night when he goes to bed and he prays. Nobody had any indication or idea as to why, you know, and I think that's what everyone's still struggling with to this day because they just want some clarity. Ryan has accepted a scholarship to play quarterback at South Carolina. He's one of the top high school quarterbacks in the country. His and Tyler's dreams are now intertwined as one. It's definitely something I, I put on my shoulders. Um, and it's definitely a burden, of course, but it's a burden I'd like to carry because I, I just want to make him happy as much as I can. College football players still look so invincible and strong in their helmets and pads, but now we've been reminded that they're just kids, really. Do the Cougars talk about Tyler? Of course they do. His loss is now a part of all of them. You know, I want to carry on his legacy and, and do what do what he did and, and just, you know, bring light to this team, and that's what he did. Smiles, smiles all around, you know. Um, so he, was, he, he just always could pick people up. Students in Pullman still feel the country's soulfulness of the place. They still say go Cougs when they see each other. But many have been touched by death now for the first time. And Tyler's loss has impacted their college experience, the Cougar experience, in ways they don't yet understand. And Mark and Kim, who've laid out their guts and sorrow for the world to see in hopes of saving young lives. They are moving to South Carolina to be closer to Ryan. They will leave behind Southern California and the Palouse, and they will start again. But there is a dull, bottomless ache where Tyler used to be, and nothing changes that. How do you find happiness again? How do you experience any joy going forward? I don't know. I, I hope at some point they will. Um, but I worry that they won't. The Holinsky family is afraid that their son will be forgotten, but that won't happen. Moving forward through the years, wherever it is that Coogs get together to talk about great games, exhilarating moments, his name will be uttered with equal parts awe and regret. They'll talk about the quick release, the quick smile, the fearlessness, the time he was carried off the field, the disease that stole him away. They'll remember the folk hero turned cautionary tale, the bright light consumed by a mystifying darkness. And they'll talk about conversations that were had and stigmas that were shattered and lives that were saved. They'll talk about Holinsky's legend, Holinsky's tragedy, and ultimately, Holinsky's hope. Tyler won't be forgotten because he was a coog. And coogs take care of coogs. Don't let go, squeeze tighter.